Hello, I am Cody. <laughs> what? <laughs> <You> like that? <laughs> Sorry, it just surprised me. It was great. Hi, I'm Cody. And I'm Brent. And we are the Hugo Knots here to review for you the best science fiction novels of all time. This week, we are super excited to have on the program Joe Haldeman and his wife, Gay Haldeman, for an interview about the Forever War, science fiction in general, uh, writing in general, uh, other stuff, whatever. Yeah, I could not be more excited about this. I mean, it's been one of my favorite books for so many years. So excited to talk with them. Um, anyway, yeah, let's do it. It's it's definitely an honor. And make sure that you uh, like, subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube or follow if you're listening to the podcast, the audio only version, um, so you do not miss next week's episode on maybe the most popular science fiction novel of all time, Ender's Game. Um, and with that said, we also have finally launched social media channels. So you can also follow us on there for some bonus content um, or just to interact with us. We mainly launched them so we could interact with more people and just chat about this stuff because we can't get enough of it. Um, so we're on all, all of the all of the platforms, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, the uh, fictional one from that Black Mirror episode, wherever you want to find us. Yeah, at Huguenots Podcast, if you want to look for us. Yeah, um, that's a, <laughs> we, they and yeah. Please that. do. Yeah, let us know. Let us know what you think of the books we're talking about. What you would think we should maybe review in future. Anyway, um, so yeah, let's talk about the Forever War. So before we we talk with Joe, I want to just sort of give a, a, a quick framing. If you haven't read this book or it's been a long time. Here's the scoop. So William Mandela was a physics student when he was conscripted into the UNEF because human colony ships uh, have started disappearing and apparently at the hands of these newly discovered aliens called Torrens. And so humanity has decided to conscript the best and brightest and go out and fight the aliens in deep space. So Mandela and the rest of the recruits are taken to an icy planetoid called Charon. Uh, interestingly, this book was written before Charon was actually discovered. Um, and there they undergo dangerous, brutal training in their, their combat exoskeletons and learn how to fight for control of the collapsars that uh, sort of are the key to, to greatly speeding interstellar travel. Soon they're deemed ready to fight and they're deployed to capture Tarn the base. During training and throughout the difficult fighting that follows, Mandela falls in love with another member of his unit, a woman named Mary Gay Potter. And so Mandela and Mary Gay do everything they can to survive the war, but if they do, they still can't return to the world they left behind. Even with the collapsars to speed interstellar journeys, the gaps between the collapsars still require accelerating up to relativistic speeds. And so every trip they take takes them further and further into the future and away from their families in the society that they left behind. It's a good one. <clears throat> Very stoked to talk to Joe and Gay Haldeman. Let's get let's get it done. For sure. Yeah, let's just go change clothes, uh, grow some beards, and do this episode. See you soon. Gay and Joe, thank you so much for, for joining us. We're really, really excited to talk with you. Oh, it's our hobby after all. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So with the with the Forever War, um, I would love to, to talk a little bit about the inspirations there. Obviously, it's it's a, you know, a book about your, your time in Vietnam. Um, but how much of what we see in the book, you know, echoes your, you know, in directly your experiences, you know, things that happened? Well, yeah, I guess... Uh, the broad outline of things is based on my experience as a soldier. But, you know, it it's in the future and they're fighting a bunch of woogly creatures that don't even breathe oxygen. So what the fuck? I mean, it's not going to be that realistic. Uh, it's uh, the, I guess in the writing of it, I based the humans on people I knew in the army. And the aliens were just, Creatures I read about in the science fiction magazines and stuff. I mean, I, I was not a tremendously scientific extrapolator of alien psychology and physiology and so forth. It's just they were enemies and I sort of made them the ideal enemies for that particular storyline. Yeah, I think they were. It wasn't about them. That's not the I think they I think they did. uh they did what they needed to do, and your big twist at the end was was great. So, um, yeah, they're they're almost uh, it's it's more about uh, the human characters, obviously, which which 
um, leads me to a question we had, which is obviously um, Mary Gay uh, is named after you, Gay. How did you How did you feel about that? And and Joe, why did you make that that choice? I wonder, like, how how is it to see yourself named in the fiction? I liked it a lot. Of course, I was I was uh, really happy about it. And he named a character in Mindbridge after my sister. And he does stuff <laughs> like that. And it was really nice. I'm glad. I haven't ever named anybody after me. I wonder why not. Mandela, you said, was oh, uh, yeah. Mandela, an anagram. Mandela is an anagram of Haldeman. Yeah. So oh, you know, that's yep. interesting. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I had to give him a name, you know, so. <laughs> uh, did, Mary Gay, did you, did he ask you before he did it or did he sort of show you a finished draft and you were like, oh, I see. No, he did. I read along as it went along. So I knew pretty early. I don't know if he asked me, okay. he just did it. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's great. So there's no reason to be upset, I guess. No, I think um, she's wonderful. Well, I, <clears throat> yeah, you know, I think, yeah, absolutely. I don't know whether I can recreate my middle state from 52 years ago but i think that basically i wanted to call her gay and i thought well no wait that just sounds so uh you know it's such a a tag and you know people were just starting to call other people who are homosexual gay it was new hmm. and so it was it was a brand new thing at the time uh and now it's, I guess, kind of really old. <laughs> <laughs> it seems, yeah, it seems like it's been. Yeah, I had no point. idea. I mean, I guess every word has to get invented sometime, but I had no idea that was uh, that was an invention of the last fifty years. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. was, a, I was pretty much an adult before it was really common to to use it that way. In fact, I think if I recall the etymology I've read, it was used by gay people before it. I'm percolated sure. into the overall consciousness. Mm. Interesting. So on that note, um, as uh, Mandela and Mary Gay are coming back to Earth throughout the book, one of the, the big thing that changes is, is obviously the, the sort of the sexuality of people on Earth. Um, what were you what were you sort of trying to explore there and what uh, what point were you trying to make? Well, I think it was very profound in that uh, when you're writing a novel, you want to throw roadblocks up for everybody. The more complicated you make the situation, the easier it is to filter out the kind of everyday things and focus in on problems that you can write about. Because fiction is all about problems. I mean, fictions that are only about everyday life uh, are pretty common now, but they were not then. And in, in general, in the whole world, you know, you very rarely sit down to write a story and say, well, I'm going to make sure nothing happens here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh-oh, breakfast. Uh, what, are you gonna, what am I going to do now? They have to decide whether to have toast. <laughs> you got to have some conflict. Yeah. He also wanted to isolate uh, Mandela. Yeah. That's one reason toward the end of the book. Uh, he's. Yeah, he was the only heterosexual person. By the end, so. Uh, yeah, and you knew a couple of gay gay service members, right? Do you think that that was how they felt? What may not be obvious anymore is that I was attempting to present the weird argument that perhaps a gay person is pretty much like a straight person in most of his <laughs> life. And I tried to do that by the, you know, obvious mechanism of making uh, my my character the opposite. But that, uh, you know, every book is sort of Every novel is sort of frozen in the time period that it was written. <clears throat> and so that aspect of the Forever War may not be as dramatic as it was back in the 60s, 70s. Yeah, you did, uh, you did something else that was, um, uh, I thought was really interesting. You had um, kind of the best and brightest get drafted and, and fight in the war, you know, people who had really advanced degrees. And you, you did that also in, in the Forever piece. Um, and I'm really curious why you made that choice, because obviously that was, you know, at the time in Vietnam, you didn't have to go to the draft if you were in college. Um, so, yeah, what what made you make that make that decision? Well, one aspect, which I think may be obscure now, is that they had it backwards. That is to say, the conduct of warfare had become more and more complicated. 
And if you wanted to make your best soldiers in terms of people who are able to cope with complicated equipment and so forth, you would draft the most intelligent and the most educated. But of course, you could never do that because the most intelligent and educated were in charge of the country. <laughs> They're not going to send each other off to die. So they had this, you know, <laughs> brilliant idea. Why don't we send the stupid people over there? Hey, good idea, Frank. That's that's your son, isn't it? No, no, no not my son. But, yeah. <laughs> Another factor was that Joe was drafted and was a foot soldier, but he had a degree in physics. They didn't use that. They didn't take that. They, no, how could they? <laughs> no. And so he was kind of like Mandela. He was too smart to be out there. Or too educated. It does feel like what they might do in the future. Like someone would figure out eventually to to conscript the smarter people, but then still bungle it by... Um, <laughs> But then still bungle it by not using them for the things they drafted them for. Um, and another bureaucracy uh, point of order that we were wondering if it if it was from personal experience that we loved in the book, the detail is that they train on, um, let me remind myself, Missouri um, in the freezing cold. And then they train on uh, Charon in the even colder, the, you know, near absolute zero. And then, of course, their first assignment is the hotter than Earth um, yeah. jungle planet. Yeah. Um, does that mirror your own experience? or? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I <laughs> in Fort Leonard Wood, where I was training for jungle warfare, we had to chip through the ice to get water to drink. And uh, it was colder than hell. I mean, just absolute blizzard conditions. <clears throat> so we were kind of glad to go off to Vietnam where it was nice and warm. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. I guess on that note, do you... Um uh, you know, both, uh, both the books in the forever sort of series have, uh, conscription. Um, I, you know, just as a person who's seen a lot more life and has been through this, do you think that we'll ever see that again in advanced economies? You know, it's, it's been, uh, you, yours was the last generation to get drafted. And, and, um, I'm curious if you think of that, that could ever happen again. Well, drafting people and the way they did it in the say 1940 to 1960 period, was predicated on the need for uh, dead weight. I mean, people who had to, who charged the enemy and died and blah, 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 and, and killed people in a pretty low-tech way. If you're just knifing people to death and shooting them with uh, single-shot weapons, well, you don't need to train them a lot. In fact, you don't want them to be too trained and intelligent and and competent because they might get the idea that we should not be doing this. <laughs> what are we shooting at each other for? Because the sergeant said we have to. Well, fuck that. <laughs> you know, just, uh, that was the very subtle message. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, obviously that comes out incredibly, both forever war, forever peace. Um, do you, it seems like, Definitely intentional in Forever Peace, but in Forever War, was that something you set out to show? Because you, you really ride this interesting um, line between like bringing in people who might be interested in uh, military exploits and weaponry and um, the, being in the military um, and making that story interesting, but then showing throughout the book. And very exciting. Yeah. yeah very and, exci you know, yeah. It's thrilling in the, in the way people think about those things. I think part of it is the conduct of a novel as opposed to the conduct of a shorter person, piece of fiction. That is to say, once you have the notion of pacifism con confronting the reader, it's really not very complicated because it makes sense to almost anybody who has a uh, fairly rational point of view and a fairly rational education that war is wrong. Oh, well, that was hard. Okay, now what do we do? But uh, so... Part of the conduct of writing a novel requires the environment for the novel to be sufficiently uh, complicated that you can't just do a uh, reduction of it to absurdity and say, uh-oh, they're shooting at me, but if I walk away, they won't shoot at me anymore. 
So <laughs> what shall I do now? Oh, let me see. I've got to think about this for a while. But, uh, you know, it, real life, of course, isn't like that. And part of the difficulty of writing a convincing novel is setting up a situation that's as complex as actual life. And especially if it's a science fiction story where, you know, you can't accept anything as, as given because things may have changed long before we get to that particular future. Yeah, well, for what it's worth, I think you do a wonderful job of that. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, one of my personal pet peeves when the way they generate that um, feeling in the novel is by having the characters all be stupid and not notice the <laughs> obvious things that are happening. It happens quite often, uh, but you never do it. And so anyway, I really I think you, you are uh, really, really excellent at building that tension in a way that felt that felt real. And, um, you know, there was no way for Mandela or anyone else to know to know the information that they, you know, that yeah. they came out at the end. So anyway, yeah, I thought it was great. Um, so the other thing that's, that's really, uh, that I wanted to ask is, um, things happen really quickly in the forever war. Um, in general, every page feels indispensable and, and, um, you know, it's tight over time. It seems like sci-fi books have gotten significantly longer on <laughs> average. Um, and I'm curious why you think that is, why is that happening? I can't just say it's because most writers are lazy. <laughs> uh, it's difficult to write tight. It's easy to just ramble on and ramble on. The Forever War is a short novel at, what, about 65, 70,000 words. And that didn't used to be so. The Forever War is the size of a science fiction novel in the 1950s, say. And... Uh, I guess because I read like an addict when I was, uh, say, from the age of 10 to about 20. That was what I perceived as the scenario for a novel. And if you, if you were to read a bunch of uh, what we called the Winston Juveniles, which was the science fiction books that were written for teenagers in that period you would see that they tend to be that way. That is to say, a sort of a cross between a novel and a short story. Hmm. A, a story, that is to say, a plot, a story, without too many bells and whistles associated with it. And I guess when I was learning how to write, partly it's learning why you like the things that you read. And the stuff that I grew up reading didn't have a lot of literary... Uh, bells and whistles. It doesn't have. It didn't have complications that a person who grew up reading Emily Dickinson or or Virginia Woolf or somebody would necessarily think was part of a story. Mm. The stories. The stories that Edgar, that uh, uh, Damon Knight and Robert Heinlein and, and those guys were writing were. State the problem, try to solve it, fail, try to solve it again, fail, figure it out and solve the problem and get off the stage. And that's basically <laughs> what I thought a, a novel was. And yeah, I learned I learned different before I started writing. But but that's the thing that's in my consciousness as a sort of er novel. I don't know. Uh, yeah, a, it's interesting. An interesting. A way this intersects with science fiction is on my. I just thought of this when I was going over various notes about it. The book that I read on the way to Vietnam was Chip Delaney's Babel 17. Oh, oh I just read that like a, a week ago. Yeah, okay, well, um, you see where I was yeah. just suddenly I was. I was superimposing this new experience for myself on the new novel, which I read, which was unlike other novels I had read in the past. And at that time, I was 24 years old, and I was getting really ready to become a writer. I had written short stories and such, and so I was, you know, the idea of writing a novel was really, really big in my mind. And so here comes Babel 17. And I thought, holy shit, 
this is a it's new crazy, movie. and it was really short. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and then oddly enough, uh, I was just out of the army a few years, a couple of years, and still writing mainly short stories when I met Chip Delaney and fell in love with him immediately. He's a wonderful guy. And uh, I don't know to what extent he influenced my writing after that. I, probably he influenced everybody writing science fiction. But uh, that was interesting, more than interesting. That's something that you don't really appreciate until years later. Yeah, I, we and, you know, we were really curious about that. To that, to that point, um, you know, f I guess this is more of a, a two-parter, but first of all, um, and Gay, if you want to speak to this too, um, it was really interesting to us that you decided to go to the Iowa Writers Workshop after you'd published The Forever War, and then obviously you win a bunch of awards while you're there for The Forever War. It goes really well. Well, um, I, sh I should point out that there was nobody else at Iowa who was writing science fiction. Nobody. Okay. Hmm. And in fact, the official... Uh, attitude was anti-science fiction completely because science fiction mm. was commercial writing and they didn't do commercial writing. They did serious writing. I mean, if you got paid for it, you're out of the camp. <laughs> <laughs> the Forever War was his master's thesis. Yeah. The only oh. master's thesis that we know of that won a Hugo and a Nebula Award. Yeah. <laughs> or that made any fucking money. <laughs> Just to be... <laughs> Oh man, that's amazing! So, uh, so when you when you went to receive those awards, if if you're at Iowa with a bunch of people who are, um, as you put it, paying attention more to the bells and whistles of writing, um, yeah. <laughs> did you did did people care? Were they excited for you, or uh, were you what was what was it like receiving those awards well, while you were? Well, the the guys at Iowa and gals uh, more more or less thought wonderful, you know. One of our one of our people, the Iowa people, has penetrated this weird hostile environment, <laughs> science fiction. <laughs> but uh, most of them said, "Well, it's an award. That's wonderful. You know, you got to get something for writing because nobody was getting any money for it." And then, uh, you know, well, it's something that just occurs to me. Everybody liked the idea that I got the Nebula and the Hugo and so forth, but then. I got a large advance, which doesn't seem that large now, but $100,000 was big money in the 1970s. And people did not accept that information with grace. The, uh, you know, that you should be making fantastically huge money writing what you want to write. Oh, come on. It doesn't happen, <laughs> does it? <laughs> One of his professors called him in and said, how did you do that? Yeah. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is basically polite English for who did you blow? <laughs> uh, everyone in America. Yeah. I guess, is, is the <laughs> uh, that's amazing. So what when when that all that was happening, um, Gay did did Joe's head start to get really big, or did he uh, did he keep a lid on it? He kept a lid on it. He doesn't. It just doesn't seem to affect him very much. No, He's I, happy to get the awards. Goodness, I'm happier than he is. Yeah. Yeah, I just, <laughs> well, for one thing, I'm also a voter for these awards. I'm, I vote for the Hugo and the Nebula and so forth. And I know how often the best pieces just evaporate. They, they don't get the awards because not everybody has the same opinion. And I've seen so many so many stories that I really liked they got nothing. And then, I'll be honest, a lot of the stories that win the awards, I think, where, where the hell did that come from? Not too often. Not too often. I usually say, well, that's not my kind of story, but I see why other people voted for it. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes I go, come on. <laughs> so, <laughs> even as a teacher, you know, as a teacher, I could talk to my students and say, well, you know, that was really good. And that one, I don't know why it won. And a professor is allowed to say that. But a writer <laughs> in isolation, if he says it, people might think, is he jealous or is he uh, just dumb? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's not a that's not a good look. Um, we have we also have similar opinions about um, some things that have won awards. So I yeah. think that's probably ubiquitous. <laughs> um, it's interesting too that that you you know you vote you vote on all these things. Um, but we've heard that you said that you don't really read that much science fiction anymore. Is that true? And why why is that? Well, there's so much else to read. Uh, is the lazy response. I think a considered response would be that uh, science fiction seems to have evolved in a direction away from my reading uh, tastes, which is fine. I mean, uh, I read the stuff that was uh, really popular in the 1950s, for instance, and I go, eh, boy, I can do better than that. And well, it's maybe one reason I became a writer. But uh, yeah, I uh, I think when I look at the whole scene nowadays in my ancient beatitude, I look at it and say, well, you know, it may just be a crapshoot if you have enough uh, perspective on it. And it may, may be that there isn't some strong correlation between lasting literary value and the and the awards and the uh, temporary popularity of something. But then I step even farther outside and say, you know, this is really, really small change compared to making a living and raising a family and and doing the things that other that real people do. Uh, so, okay, this is my little world. This is my little universe. And uh, I feel free to cling to my uh, fallacies and you know, <laughs> go ahead with life. I read all the nominees as much as I can and yeah. recommend to him, and then he will read them and actually likes them, yeah. mostly yeah. the ones I like. But he likes to read other stuff now. Yeah. he's Well, he's read so much science fiction, and he also doesn't want to repeat what other people are doing. He wants to go out and find other ideas. Yeah, that makes sense. Have too much influence. Well, yeah. we'll make sure to ask you at the end, Gay, that uh, about some recommendations as well. Because, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask an obvious. Let me ask the obvious one from the outside, as like a you know a, a, a student of the genre and a person who wrote a you know I wrote a book that maybe is bad, but anyway, we'll keep trying. Um, the uh, the the obvious comparison though is for for like the you know the power armor suits. Uh, is Starship Troopers, right? Like, I, I, you know, that was that was huge. Everybody read it, and this is. Yeah. There, I'm sure there were other stories that that happened before that 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 sort of created that idea. But I think that's the first mega popular one that stood the test of time. I mean, had you had you read Starship Troopers before? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And of course, you know, of course it influenced me. I mean, it was a very popular book, and everybody was talking about it. And besides the simple, <laughs> it's just. Logic, if you're going to fight a war in outer space, and this is what I was doing, I was translating the Vietnam War into outer space. I mean, that's a sort of a low IQ response, but <laughs> what are you going to fight a war in outer space with? Uh, your underwear? I mean, you've got to have all these machines and stuff to give you a workable environment, and you, you want to have extremely powerful weapons because your enemy has extremely powerful weapons. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, I totally hear it. And I think that's why the, you know, the people call them tropes or whatever, but the reason certain uh, scientific technologies appear in so much sci-fi is, yeah, when you think about it hard, it's the rational response. It's probably the thing, if the world is like that in the future, that's a thing that will, you know, that, that certainly could be there. So yeah, I very much hear you. To that point, um, I was just going to ask uh, quickly, um, did did Heinlein, speaking of him, in Starship Troopers, did he present you the Hugo no. for no. Forever War? Okay, because I heard he was presiding that year. No, he was there. He he didn't. He wasn't the Toastmaster. He was yeah. the guest of honor. Oh, yeah. guest of honor. Okay. Yeah. Um, he liked the book. He, he did. Came, yes. He went out of his way to come across the room and shake Joe's hand and say how much he liked the book. And Joe's feet didn't touch the floor for another forty-eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. So I would I would ask what was that like, but it, it, that was a that was a wonderful yeah, I mean, succinct wonderful. description. <laughs> but there's a backstory there too, because Heinlein uh, 
was not a big fan of other science fiction writers. No. And the other guys who had uh, written war novels, future war novels, none of them were soldiers. I mean, none of absolutely none mm. of them. And that got under Heinlein's skin, or got stuck in his craw, or some such metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so part of his admiration for the Forever War was <laughs> clearing his craw of the old... Oh, the other science fiction novels. That's just so cool. I don't know a better way to say it. So, so what do you think for for you know from a um, what what do you think differentiates science fiction? Like, what why does something get called science fiction and some things don't? I mean, there's a lot of um, novels that kind of walk the line, and I feel like putting something in science fiction can sometimes um, uh, categorize it away from certain audiences. Well, I've always agreed with the people who say the th thing that differentiates differentiates science fiction from fiction fiction is sense of wonder, which is hard to define, but you can see when it happens in a story and when it doesn't happen. It's quite possible to write a novel that's pure science fiction from page one to page 480. It doesn't have one particle of sense of wonder. <laughs> when it's just a bunch of dudes walking around in the future and there is no nothing special about it and the specialness is the part that you can't teach anybody and that other people don't see uh, and <laughs> I think it may be and this is a stretch but <laughs> it may be like trying to talk about religion to a non-believer if you are a believer, you say, you know, there are things that I could try to articulate, but I would fail. And you would fail no matter how well I did my job. Like, as an atheist, I hardly, I understand, I, I can say that I understand religious faith, but I don't really understand it. Because a person who understands it probably doesn't have to ask the questions I do. And if you're a nice guy, you know, and I am a nice guy. My mother brought me up to be a nice guy. And a nice guy doesn't buttonhole some priest on the corner and say, how can you put up with that bullshit? You, know, just, you don't do that because you are a nice guy to priests as well as other people. Uh, I don't know. It's a... Yeah, this is a conversation that has suddenly ranged all the way from God to butterflies to slugs. But you know, I, I personally good am ones in too. favor of yeah. slugs. But yeah. hey, Gay, what do you what do you think about? Do you have any opinions about science fiction versus like what makes something science fiction? I think Joe's right about sense of wonder, and I think it has something to do with surprises uh, and surprising you about uh, uh, what you're reading. Um, what was Damon Knight's definition of science fiction? Science fiction is anything that I point out and call science fiction. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's hard to define. So that supreme, what that Supreme Court definition? Um, you know when you see it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I know when I see it. That's it. <laughs> Some mainstream literature and people who say they aren't science fiction writers write science fiction. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, fa fa we were the one we've been we were talking about as we were thinking about this. You know, Kajuro Ishiguro just wrote like another science fiction novel. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But nobody, Ooh, they don't put they don't put him they don't put those books of his in that section no. because <laughs> uh, you know for whatever reason because he's um, a bestseller already. And yeah. Well, I mean, and for a, good reason. He's and, unbelievable. But yeah, they don't, <laughs> they don't categorize him. It's a it's a publishing category as much as anything yeah. too. But you know what Shigeru has is, sen excuse me, is a sense of wonder. But you don't yeah. call it sense of wonder when a genius has it. It's, uh, <laughs> it's just his talent. He is this wonderful guy. But uh, if uh, you know, James Blish has it, it's just, wow, sense of wonder. He's got it. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. So can you tell us about why um, – 
why you wrote forever peace when or sorry not forever peace forever free when the forever war you know didn't you know didn't really seem to call for for a sequel hmm time travel time let me see what was in my mind what was in your mind was I, uh, a big advance from your publisher who really, really, really wanted you to write a sequel, and you had <laughs> fought it forever. Yeah, yeah, I fought it, and I fought it, and I fought it until the— Then he gave up. <laughs> yeah. But I had, uh, in fact, when The Forever War first came out, I had written on a piece of paper that I should you know, come up with a, a sequel called Forever, Free, forever Peace, uh, because it's just an obvious idea. And I may have written down a couple of lines about it. But, you know, the book I wrote after The Forever War is called All My Sins Remembered. It was just an ex- Mind bridge. Okay, well, that's the... Uh, the, <laughs> the chronologies are strange because I, I wrote All My Sins Remembered as a short novel, which I later expanded into a novel. And... In that same time period, I wrote Mind Bridge. Mm. And I don't know. I'm trying to get my head into what a guy is like when he's not even 30 years old. I mean, that's that's a distance to travel. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, yeah. you've been remarkably honest in, in this interview and lots of others as well about sort of the, the uh, you know, writing is a thing you do to be creative. But also, if you want to do it all the time, it needs to be a thing you do to make money. Yeah, sure. Um, and, it's also true uh, of philosophy, you may have noticed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, I'm curious what you think of of writing, you know, as a as a as a way to make money. You know, there's lots of people in science fiction who are you know big fans, and they think about writing books. And uh, yeah, I'm just curious what you would uh, how you, how you think about that. Well, I don't have to think about it anymore, of course. But uh, when I was a young writer and figuring. What am I going to write next? It was important. And in that case, there was a decision-making process, which was about basically how serious am I about this? Am I trying to break new ground here? Am I trying to analyze the things that are successful now and do that? I don't know. Most writers sit down and you've got a stack of paper, whether or not it's actual or is a keyboard or whatever. And you fill up that paper with something that eventually will become a published work in some form. And I guess you're, many people are thinking about their theoretical audience and say, well, what will entertain them? What will intrigue them? I don't, I, I don't do that. I've, I've written books to order, you know, series books that had to have this and that happen and so forth. The Star Trek Books. Yeah, Star Trek, for instance. Uh, but that's usually not the environment I'm working in. In fact, I'm working in a an environment that's as much poetry as prose. I'm much concerned with the way words sound. And when I'm writing, even if I'm just typing on a word processor, the sound of the words is going through my mind. <clears throat> and I don't know... Is that significant? I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure whether other writers do this without knowing it. Uh, Gay told me that uh, she she has been in another in an adjacent room while I'm writing, even with an old manual typewriter, and I'm saying the lines over and over before I type them out, and maybe I'm listening to the sound of them. The headline in the Iowa Press Citizen <laughs> after an interview was science fiction writer mumbles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. He does. He talks, his, talks these things out. So he doesn't do a lot of rewriting. No, I, I'm a very uh, oral kind of a writer. Oh, interesting. And, and so as, as that applies to writing as a profession, would you say it's more about just do, do it and enjoy it um, for the craft and then hope that you can get published and you're lucky if you do? Well, my perception of it is a little different from that because <clears throat> I've been published from the very first. I mean, 
I didn't go through this sort of going through reams of paper and throwing away and saying, God, will I ever figure this out? I figured it out. I figured it out before my second story. And I really think that's true. And I think it's true of about a half of the people I know who write for a living. Uh, there are people who just throw away draft after draft and kind of get it through a slow accretion of experience. And there are people who just sell from the get-go, which is the group I belong to. And this group is about a half or a third of all the writers I know. If it's not easy for you, why don't you get, go get a job that's easy? I mean, that's not a sarcasm. That's just an observation. Uh, most of the people I know who write for a living find it pretty easy. And if they say they don't, you should look over their shoulder while they're working <laughs> and see, well, yeah, that's not hurting them real, real hard. It's a good little aphorism for that. <laughs> go get a job that's easy. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, Brent, do you have anything else about books, writing? Uh, well, I just wanted to ask, are, Joe, are you still writing? And if so, what are, you, what are you working on these days? You know, a lot of the writing I do is poetry, and most of it is just nonfiction stuff. I just, I write essays, and people look at them, and I, I guess I'm a blogger as much as I am any other kind of <laughs> On Facebook, he's On a Facebook, blogger. yeah. That's, that's where his writing lives these days. He doesn't feel compelled to write fiction anymore. Right. And Which partly this is, this is a result of uh, aged prosperity. I mean, if I had to write to make groceries, I'd be out cranking out short fiction and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> My groceries just tumble in down. They they come down the ceiling like down the chimney like Santa Claus. Oh, is that <laughs> what you think? <laughs> I know she thinks I should go to the grocery store with her every now and then. And, and, he does. He does. Yeah. Um. At uh, you know, I I was reading some of. We were both reading some of the like the the more blog stuff that you've done in the diary um type things and they're they're funny which also the forever war uh has has that too and your you know your other novels um what what do you think about humor in writing it's such a different st type of humor does it just happen it just comes out for you or is it a is it an approach different than you know conversational humor um what what do you think about humor in writing i think it comes out for me uh partly you know i'm basically a western guy a southwestern guy, if you want to say. And my pattern for storytelling is the oral storytelling thing. You come you say, you know, you know what happened to me when I was down in Arkansas? <laughs> you you think people are crazy here. Well you ought to try Arkansas. That's where the crazy people hang out. And basically this is a storytelling motif that you absorb. Now I don't recall my father ever sitting down to tell me a story, but he did. I found out later. He would make up stories for me and my brother uh, about muffin dragons. And we nobody ever knew what a muffin dragon looked like, but they were there. And they caused people to do things that didn't make sense. <laughs> and I'm going, well, is that where science fiction came from for me? And I think maybe it was. Uh my father was so uh, dismissive of my career as a writer that he would never admit that he partly caused it. <laughs> but it's there, I'm sure. But well, he must have. Your brother was a writer too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And my brother... He definitely wrote, needs some blame then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, he wrote humor too. I mean, this was part of our upbringing that uh, we'd tell each other stories, of course, and there usually were stories with a sarcastic or a, a humorous ending of some kind. They would crack each other up. Yeah. <laughs> Driving along. the rest of us do. Yeah. So, yeah. So at the end of our episodes, we always, uh, typically we're covering an individual book. We talk about it a, you know, a, fair, about, a fair bit. And then at the end, we will uh, recommend some related books. Um, and so uh, Joe wanted to ask you, 
the forever war of course is you know by far your your most famous book for people who loved it what other books of yours you know what, what would you would you recommend people pick up next oh let me see camouflage camouflage i suppose is the one that i was i figure is most successful for me but there are others uh I don't know. I've got a lot of books of mine that I... The Accidental well, Time Machine is one of my favorites. Yeah, The Accidental Time Machine is... Uh, uh, Speaking of humor. <laughs> yeah. The uh, I don't sit around and reread my books and say, oh my God, what talent. <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> my, uh, well, well, Gay, what about what, what do you think? It seems I'm like you have the Rex. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Accidental Time Machine and Camouflage... And the Worlds Trilogy, if you want hard science fiction, the Worlds Trilogy. Worlds, Worlds Apart, and Worlds, worlds Enough in Time. time. You could just fall into those books, I think. I'm not biased at all, but I love those <laughs> books. Of course not. <laughs> well, like a lot of trilogies, the Worlds Trilogy is really kind of one book broken into one three sections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Like a okay, good trilogy. what about maybe even a... A harder question or maybe it's easier um what about if you had to recommend someone else's you know science fiction books what do you what do you think are the the you know if you had to pick just a few you know for people who are new to the genre or whatever else if they're gonna gonna get into it what would you suggest well my actual tastes are mired in the stone age of science fiction so probably you wouldn't want to ask me no we do that's why we're asking we you. do we're asking yeah <laughs> yes, we want all ages yeah, if you had to read some old Jurassic kind of science fiction, what would you read? Uh, you know, Heinlein. Well, I I have reservations about Heinlein uh, for, as a modern reader. Uh, I have reservations about everybody. <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, Vonnegut can always be reread. He finds his own context. Uh, Vonnegut was a naive writer. I think he made himself naive. And, and so you have to re-understand him every time you come to him, which is a virtue in a writer. Uh, a person reading me, for instance, kind of adjusts his viewpoint to a 60s, 70s, 80s kind of a writer. And I don't mind that. That's okay. Uh, when I read Hemingway, and I read Hemingway all the time, but I always have to put on kind of a 1930s hat to read him properly. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I read the other writers of his era, like I love John Dos Passos, but I can't read him the same way I read a, a 21st century writer. But that's not wrong. That doesn't make the experience of reading John Dos Passos or Robert Heinlein less than reading a modern writer. It's just a different way of reading. And if you read a writer trying to be ignorant or dismissive or uh, trying to ignore the era in which he was writing, you're doing him a disservice. It's like you're reading a bad translation of his work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay, and um, what about you, Gay? Since you're you're reading more of the 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 modern stuff, if you had to recommend a few sort of more recent sci-fi books to people, what uh, would you pick? I recommend that people read the winners of the the more recent winners of the Hugo. I really love Martha Wells' murder bot stories, and I think she won the Hugo this year for the. She for, just did, yeah, yeah, for Network Effect. That. I love those stories. This character is quite something. Um, Ted Chang is oh, yeah. wonderful. <laughs> Everything he's favorite, likes I is think. Yeah. I, I love Ted Chang. Uh, yeah. He's terrific. Um, and he's the right kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the stories, yeah. yeah. And N.K. Jemison, who won mm -hmm. three Hugos in a row for three books in a row, which rarely happens, yeah. is a, quite a fine writer. And yeah, that's an incredible series. And and she, uh, I was going to say earlier too, she had the same thing that you said, Joe. She, N. K. Jemison said um, that she was reading science fiction and fantasy, and she was like, "I could do this better." So that's why she started writing. <laughs> <laughs> and then won all the awards. Pretty yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. 
those are all those are all great recommendations. And I love Lois McMaster Bujell's series. Yeah, yeah. Um, anything she writes. I do too. I don't think she's she's one that we're really trying to to talk up because I am worried that she there's a chance she's going to fall into uh, you know not not make it into the canon, and I think she absolutely oh, no. deserves to be because there's. A, People, you'd be surprised how many people I talk to who are younger and they have never even heard of her, never read any of the books. So we're very much on a campaign to to to, to get more people reading her her books because they're so uh, they're, they're so interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're just good. <laughs> well, you know, I it's an odd thing not to have perceived from the beginning, but I see I have an oddly I don't know prejudiced readership because I never would have considered myself a war writer. I'm just a science fiction writer. Hmm. But I think a lot of my readers say, oh, he's a war writer and he's been a soldier and all this crap. Well, (laughs) are you surprised to understand that I never think of that? Yeah. There's an interesting thing. I mean, it feels like our current culture is um, very much trying to think about creators in that way we sort of want them to represent some thing some idea but yeah of course that's not how people actually think of ourselves we think of ourselves as people uh yeah well are we are we a labeling culture do we have to (laughs) sort people into their little boxes i think so i mean one thing that really really influenced myself as a reader and as a writer was samuel r delaney because he knew science, it was obvious that he knew science and respected it after a fashion, but that's not what he was about. I mean, you read Heinlein and Anderson and, and Pohl and so forth, and you say, these guys have a positive view of science and engineering, and they, you know, they're out to save the world, partly by uh, turning it into an engineer, engineering wonder. And... <laughs> It's not there in any uh, later era of science fiction. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. We'll see what happens. There's, um, uh, I think, I think we're just in a, a current. A lot of people feel badly about the world in a lot of ways, and so we think yeah. that we must have done some things wrong in the recent past. And of course, the thing in the recent past that's changed is is technology. So yeah. um, we'll see. I'm. I certainly hope. That some of those attitudes will change because, uh, yeah, you know, when you when you look around, more people can eat than ever have been able to before. Um, but people don't think that the the world is is getting better anymore. Um, so you know, we'll see. We'll see what the happens. The world would be better if the United States is being run by an ignorant blowhard. <laughs> and so, no, wait, did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, Joe's well, latest been... book, which we haven't mentioned, is Work Done oh, for Hire. Oh, please, yes. Yes, we are going to ask about Work Done for Hire. Good. <laughs> it's one of the best works of Western literature. I'm surprised people don't talk about it all the time. But... Yeah, right. <laughs> but it has a, a, a former soldier as the main character. Yeah, true. Your, his uh, readership that, uh, that wants the war stuff might enjoy Work Done for Hire. Yeah. Yeah, and you brought some of your... Uh, uh, cycling journey stuff into yeah. it too right yeah yeah right what you do <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah it works well it has been just absolutely so wonderful talking with both of you thank you so much for for taking the time to talk with us and um you know this has been a real treat for for both cody and i i mean we've uh, before we started doing this and talking about you know books and and trying to, to introduce more people to them um you know just for so much before that, you know, yours is a, a name that I've thought about for so many years in my life. So it's really, it's really wonderful to, to get to meet you. And um, uh, thanks so much for, for taking the time to talk with us. Sure. It's been a treat for us to call, call anytime. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we might just take you up on that. Yeah.